So we're continuing in Romans at the minute. Um, we may <coughs> finish by end of the year, we may not, who knows? I don't think we will, but where we're going. So Romans 8 is uh, what we're jumping into. So last week, uh, we started Romans 8 on that first verse, therefore there is now no condemnation. And we looked at that Romans 8 starts with there is now no condemnation and it finishes, at the end of the chapter, with there is now no separation. But in between, there's a lot of information that we're going to start just to unpack as we go through it. So, Romans 8 verse 1, and I'll read down to verse 4 and then we'll, we'll move on from there. It says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit has given, us, has given life and, um, and set you free from the law of sin and death. For what this law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened uh, by the flesh, God did by sending his only son in the likeness of sinful man um, to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law may be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. So verse 4, I'm just going to unpack a little bit and then we'll move on. Um, in the... Uh, NIV, which is the version I often use, uh, I know it's limitations, I know um, there's certain little things about it, but it's what I like and it's what I can read. Um, other people love the, the New King James, some people still like the King James version, some people like the New American Standard version, and some people can even read the Greek and then translate it straight to English. So, wherever that fits with you, my reading ability is usually NIV or um, the NLT, that's what I like when I'm reading. But it starts off with this, it says um, that we do not live according to the flesh. In the NIV it says sinful nature. And I used to think, well that's straightforward, it's our nature, it's a sinful side of us. But the word flesh there means more than just our nature. It actually does mean literally flesh, meat which all the vegetarians go, there, I'm telling you, we don't live according to the meat eating, we live according to the spirit. And all the meat eaters go, no, we're off for a steak, see you later. But the word literally, it's, it's sparkers, and it actually means flesh, carnal, merely of human origin, or empower, human empowerment. So anything that, when it talks about flesh, it means anything of us. What's of us? So it's not just the skin, the meat, it means what our nature's like, it means our carnal side to us. There's a version, this is what it says in the Greek, it says, it can be used positively, but often used negatively. And it refers to making decisions, actions, according to self, i.e. done apart from faith, independent of God's inner working. Thus what is of the flesh is carnal, and it is defined as displeasing to the Lord. It's actually seen as being disrespectful to God. In short, flesh generally relates to the unaided human effort, i.e. decisions, actions, and the origins from ourselves, or the empowerment of ourselves. This is carnal of the flesh, and proceeds out of an untouched, unchanged part of us, i.e. what is not transformed by God. So basically, when it talks about being carnal or of the flesh, that is operating from a side of us that's yet not been submitted to God. Which I find rather confusing because when someone becomes a Christian, we should give ourselves entirely over to God and submit everything to God. But I've found over the years that often people give their lives to God, but then there's a gradual transformation as time goes on. In the Amplified Bible, it says this. So, so that the, the righteous and just requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not live according to the ways of the flesh, guided by the worldliness of the sinful nature, but live our lives in a way of the Spirit as he guides us and empowers us. So Paul's talking about two different attitudes that people have. Now, there's lots of people say different things. They're talking about the Christian and the non-Christian, the carnal Christian or the mature Christian. And you're going to have to work that out for yourself as we work our way through. But there's a few things that I just want to point out. That it does seem to me that Paul's talking about the spiritual Christian and the carnal Christian. 
Now, can somebody be carnal and still a Christian? Well, the way to become a Christian is to believe. Remember in Romans 5, verse 1, it said, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, to become a Christian, it's not about what we can do. All we can do, if there is anything we can do, is accept God by faith. We can accept the message by faith. But then, there should be an ongoing work in our body. So I often say to people, prove from prove by your lifestyle fruits of repentance. So when someone's been saved a short time, there should be something that is evidence that they are a Christian. So when I became a Christian, one of the first things that changed in my life, which I didn't notice, my friends noticed, now given the fact that I was still fighting, is a different side of it, but my friends noticed I'd stopped swearing. Because I realised I could go to church and didn't swear for two hours or three hours, depends how long it was. So I just basically stopped it off or God took it from me. So I saw, and my friends noticed, so they did everything they could to try and get me to swear. Which was quite fascinating because I didn't know what was going on. So they noticed a change in me. The fighting then changed later on and other things changed as it went on. But there was evidence in my life right from the beginning that God was doing something in my life. So for example, another thing that happened to me when I first got saved, I started reading the Bible and I fell in love with it. I couldn't get enough of it. I had to read it. And I don't understand people who don't have a heart for the Word of God. Now, given the fact that my reading ability is less than an eight-year-old, I'm told, you know, I never got my GCSE in English or my O-level or what other one I took. I took an, um, another lower example. You know, people from foreign countries can come and pass tests in English that I can't even do. You know, it's the way my mind works. It's like everything's jumbled up and stuff like that. I was the first person in my school to get tested for dyslexia, which is fascinating, considering God's got me reading to you guys every week. And that's why I encourage you to have your own Bible, because sometimes it makes absolutely no sense to me when I'm reading it. I don't see full stops, I don't see commas, you know, and there's letters and stuff all mixed in, and numbers, and I'm the mind just, I've got to try and learn it off by heart. And you'll always tell when I'm using a translation that I'm not used to, because I get lost. I've got to put fingers on it and I've got to... But God uses me. So I fell in love with the Word of God. Somebody who can't really read. And I read the Bible. Now they told me not to start at the beginning. Okay. Uh, so we started in John. Then they told me not to read the end. By this time I thought I'm going to do it. What the idea for? I'm going to read the end. And then I'll go to the beginning. So I did. And I... Revelation. I love it. I can't, because I didn't have any bodies external influence on revelation i read it and understood it it was like it's clear to me i can't see what complication is but i understood it so when you become a christian things should change so there's four types of people um there's a non-christian the non-christian is ruled by their senses and their carnal mind so basically they think about it and some non-christians have a, a moral compass they know certain things wrong because I do believe God's built in every one of us a moral compass but they often give in to certain stuff or give in to lots of things and it's usually over time nobody becomes you know a, a murderer overnight it's usually a process nobody becomes a thief overnight it becomes a process of, of thinking the mind gets warped a little bit but non-christians tend to do whatever they want whenever they want so being a non-christian did I say a non-Christian earlier? Yeah. A non-Christian, it's actually easy. Just do it. I don't like you. You don't like me. Let me smack you. That was simple. I didn't realise that as a Christian, you had to be nice to people. But even worse than that, you had to love people. It just got awkward there after. But then the second group of people are the new Christians, the baby Christians. They've just got saved. These are awesome people. I love them because they are so pliable. They, they're so manageable in God, you can really just pump some good stuff into them. And I always try to get around non-Christians to give, tell them who they are in Christ, tell them the good things God's got to them before the miserable, stale Christians tell them, oh, you need the joy of the Lord. Which I think some of you guys need to let that joy, after that video, you need to let the joy flow. So, if you want, so a new Christian, they're saved and some things have changed. But they're still living 
a lot of their life from, from the flesh, from the carnal side. Why? Because they don't know any better. See, I didn't know fighting were wrong until somebody says, really, as a Christian, you shouldn't be fighting. So I went, really? They said, yeah. I said, am I allowed to... Uh... And they said, no. Whatever you're thinking, no. I said, what about if someone hits me? They said, you've got to turn the cheek. Ah, I thought. So the next person who wanted to face up to me, I said, you can have the first two punches. Pretty good, isn't it? Turn the cheek. Then I can beat the living daylights out of them. That were pretty, but they said you really shouldn't get into that sort of thing. Now, given I'm working in a nightclub at the time, it kind of got a bit awkward, but I left that job. Oh, no. So as a new Christian, some things changed. So when I became a Christian, things changed for God, but there's some stuff I had to give up. I had to give up stuff. Now, people don't often tell you that when you become a Christian, you've got to give up stuff. You've got to give up stuff. So, my dad was into witchcraft, mum was into spiritualist church, and I were involved in both at different levels. So when I became a Christian, I had to give that up because light and darkness don't mix. I had to give up some bad friends, bad company, corrupt character. My grandma used to tell me I didn't realise it was in the Bible. So the people you hang around with will, will change and damage you if you're not careful. But as a young Christian, I got into the Word of God, but I also had to change. And God started to speak to me through the Word and through the preaching. And my life started to change. And if you've just become a Christian, your life should gently, gradually change. Now, there might be some great leaps forward. Woohoo! I've stopped doing this. Several questions I asked when I got sick, because I needed to know. Number one, I said, when I die, am I going to go to heaven? And the guy said, no, because you're not a Christian. You're going to go burn in hell. I thought, great. I said, if I become a Christian, can I still have sex? He said, no. That guy didn't want to be my friend. He won't give me the answers I want to. He went straight. So, in this world of confusion, people often say to me, am I all right being a Christian and still being this, which is contrary to the word of God? I say, no. If you want to do that, don't become a Christian. But they live life the best you can. I've got a friend who still watches my life from when I got saved. To see if it's real. So I told him, I said, either turn to Jesus or become the world's best sinner. Because when you get 12, you're not going to enjoy it. So at least enjoy it now. That's, to me, it's logical. My dad says to me, don't rob a post office where you're going to spend 20 years in prison. Go rob a bank and make it worth it in case you get locked up. Make it worth it. But the same is in Jesus. When you become a Christian, Let's make it worth it. Because it's got so much more than staying a baby Christian. The next group is people that's been saved a while. I call these the growing Christians. These are people that are growing in God, but you know, God's working through their lives, but they're getting into these things called having to forgive people. That's hard, isn't it? Forgive people when they've done awful things to you or to somebody you love. You know, temptation. Oh. Not like that one either. You can get tempted. James said you're only tempted with things that you can be tempted by. Also, growing Christians, they get to that point where they need to learn to trust God more. See, I don't have a problem tithing because when I first got saved, someone said you need to tithe. And they show me the Bible. Like, yeah, okay, I'll tithe. Never been a problem since. They said you need to read your Bible. Read my Bible. They said you've got to pray. I'll pray. They said you've got to witness. Witness. They never said I had to go to church, but I thought that was normal anyway. But they told me stuff, and I just did it because I just thought, this is what Christians do. You know, most non-Christians know what Christians should be doing. And yet some Christians are confused about what they should be doing. So there's a baby Christian, and God is changing their life, and there's been some changes, but they're good at this ongoing. There's a maturing, the, the growing Christian and that's God's working things out in their life. They're changing steadily, slowly. And then there's a mature Christian. The mature Christian is somebody who lives by the Spirit at least most of the time, but sometimes lives by the flesh. Because it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Somebody irritates you and irritates you. Sometimes that old nature comes out. Argh! You know what I mean? You growl at them. Or maybe just me. Maybe you're so far ahead, I'm inspired. But the truth is, even pastors mess up every now and then. I try not to, and I desperately try not to do when you're there. But what you get, what you see is what you get. So this is what I'm like at home. 
except for I don't sit around in my underpants. You know what I mean? When I'm in church, because that just won't be good, would it? We're having fun. So, there's three, dif- uh, three different types of Christian. There's, the Bible talks about there's a carnal Christian and a spiritual Christian. My problem I have is when somebody's been saved and they've been saved for a length of time, then they regress back into doing things they gave up. Or somebody's been saved a number of years and then they start compromising in areas that they would never have compromised when they were a younger Christian. You could say when you're younger, you're on fire, but as you get older, it kind of calms down. It should never calm down. You should be a, a Christian it was on fire all the time. It should be increasing and increasing, not slowing down. You know, physically you might want to slow down, but spiritually you should be soaring and being awesome for God and just moving forward. I really have questions when I see people calming down in the things of God. And it must be an age thing, and I'm fighting it all the time. But after watching that video, I don't know if you saw it, there were some people at least in their middle age. And they were swinging it. When I used to go to parties when I was younger, I was the life and soul of a party. I mean, I could go and I'd be dancing on tables and all sorts, and I never touched a drop, a drink. I was having a laugh as a Christian because that was, to me, this is the only way. I thought I got life and life to a full, so I'm going to live life to a full, and we're going to have a great time, and we're going to be awesome, and everybody else needed a drink, but I didn't. I had Jesus. The Bible says don't get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know, I'm not saying that when you, you, you get into a lot of messy stuff, you're not careful. What he's saying is you don't need something to liberate you. You've got the Spirit of God. And yet many Christians, it's like when you first get saved, you're on fire for God. You're tearing down the street, you're witnessing to people. And then some miserable, old, sour-faced, sucking lemons, so-called Christian tells you, you shouldn't do this sort of thing. You need to grow up. You know, I'd rather you act like you did when you were first saved than be miserable and, and you know, people want to see life and life to the full. And let's face it, I'm not being so blunt. Well, I am being blunt. But the, the closer you get to that old age or whatever time you're going to die at 110, the closer you get, the more excited you should get. Because you're going up to Jesus. But they get miserable. Oh, I remember when. Who cares what when? Who cares? It's today and forward. It's about Jesus. It's not about what has happened. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. That's great. But it says, do this in remembrance of me until I come back. Look forward. I have known Christians who would never lie through the teeth to start lying. What's going on? Compromising. Compromising. Carnal- carnality. Is that the right word? Fleshliness starts creeping in. What happens is, when we're young, we give ourselves, I mean young Christian, we give ourselves to Jesus, we jump in, we go for it. But then as time gets on, we kind of, the devil tempts us to compromise. Might be on our tax return. Might be on a whisper. Might be a compromise of truth. But Paul says this, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. I have people who've been saved for years telling me that it's okay to do sins that we weren't allowed to do when I was younger. Because it's okay now. We've all grown up a little bit. No, if it was a sin 20 years ago, it's a sin today and it'll be a sin in 20 years' time. If Jesus said it were wrong in his day, it's still wrong today. No matter what the world says, because the world is living carnal to the theme of flesh, the world wants us to realise that, or they believe that they can live this world and run this world without God. And that's why, bless them, the UN, they want to have a, a utopia, a pleasant world, a world of peace without God. There'll never be peace without God. In fact, Jesus said, I've come and you know, brought the sword. You know, people are going to turn against each other. But the truth is that we can't accept the things of God unless we are in the Spirit. And as believers, we are in the Spirit. We've got the Spirit of God living inside of us. It continues, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set 
So this is verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. You can always tell where somebody's mind is by their actions. Everything starts in your mind. You know, I've told this many times before, we're made up of three parts. We've got a body. The outside. Yes, one day you might have a body like mine. You know what I mean? We've got this body on the outside. And on the other side, we've got our spirit. The bit that's connected to God. The Holy Spirit lives in our spirit and we're connected. And then in the middle, we've got our mind, our thinking. And the problem is that our flesh is trying to tell our mind what to do because our flesh is going, I want that cake. And my mind's going, you're on a diet. I want that cake. You're on a diet. I want that cake. You're on a diet. Okay, I want that cake. Okay, have the cake. I've seen people like that with two-year-olds. Parents who just give in to them for a quiet life. If you don't believe me, try fasting. The body's going, food, 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 food. And your spirit's going, pray, 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 pray. And the mind's going, I'm schizophrenic. <laughs> the case is, when you set aside time to pray, your flesh will rise up. You just, Why is it? Whenever you decide you want to read the Bible, something always crops up. You weren't thinking about doing the washing at all. You pick your Bible, go, I'm going to spend some time with Jesus. Oh, the washing needs to win. Where did that come from? Why does that happen? Because the devil doesn't want you in the word of God. And why is it when you say, you know what, I'm going to get up five minutes early and pray. Five minutes. You can't. Because your flesh is going, sleep, sleep, sleep. And your spirit's going, live, live. And your mind is in great confusion. Your mind is a battlefield. And if your mind is set on the things of the flesh, if your eyes are always looking at something that's wrong, you will gravitate towards that. But if your mind is set on the things of God, you will gravitate towards that. If your mind is set on the Word of God, you will read the Word of God. If it's, sat, if it's set on doing things that are dishonouring to God, you will do that. What you're thinking is, is where you will go. And as a Christian, as a young Christian, your mind needs to be renewed. And as you get older, it should be renewed. That's why if someone's been saved 20... I knew someone had been saved 20 years, 20 plus years, and we're acting like a, a one-year-old in God. It's like, grow up. Now, I know that some Christians have lifetimes of struggle in certain areas. I understand that. But generally, we should be growing out of these things. The power of God is awesome. He breaks chains. He sets people free. He releases us from guilt. And he, he just sets us on a path. He gives us a course in life. And he fills us with his spirit. And he gives us life. And he can break any chain. Now, some chains get broken instantly. And some chains, chains take a, a while. But you've got to keep your thinking on it. I don't like getting too personal on stuff, but there was a, a, a short time ago, you know, there was something wrong, uh, and I had to go to God and say, God, I need you to heal this situation, and I need it now because I don't like it. And uh, it didn't happen. So I went, you know what, let's just run with this. So I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and I'd be, I'd be praying as I'm waking up. Because my mind was set on the fact we're going to deal with this, we're going to work this one out. And it might not have happened instantly, because usually it happens instantly. But I think God will teach me something. And so I progressed through it to the point where, and I'd be laid there, and I'd move, and it didn't hurt, and I'd be praising him, waking up praising him. Because suddenly it changed from, I need healing to being, my mind, my focus is on Jesus. See, my mind and my focus is not on what somebody else tells me it should be thinking. My mind and focus on Jesus. So I wake up praying sometimes, I wake up singing, which is bizarre. You know what I mean? I wake up quoting, especially on Sunday, because I've got to be spiritual. So it's all right for you guys, you can sleep in on Sunday. I've got to be up at six, but this morning I go up at seven. Because I've been up at three with, with a dog. It's not a stupid dog, but it's a dog. Who needed to have a wee? Why well, I couldn't wait for it. And why is it at 11 o'clock when I throw him out, he stands there looking at me? It's not three o'clock yet. You know what I mean? Get out! That's when you see a different side of Johnny. <laughs> Get out! Get out of here! See, 
We need, verse 6, Romans 8 verse 6 is the mind governed by the flesh, by our sinful nature, by the desires, is death. But the mind that's governed by the spirit is life and peace. What do you want? Life and peace, think on Jesus. Or do you want death, which is doing what the flesh... Now, death, it doesn't happen instantly. The wages of sin is death, it says. And sin will kill. It's deadly. And the flesh, all the flesh wants is, is basically its own way. You love this when two year olds do it when they want their way and the battle starts. If anybody's ever had little toddlers, it's fantastic. It's not. But our mind, our thinking needs to be on, focused on Jesus. The mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. If all you're ever thinking about is fleshly things, it's hostile to God. Now, the Greek word there goes into a lot of things, but hostile means it's against. Your mind, if it's thinking about how it can satisfy itself, whether that's watching things on the internet, whether it's doing things you shouldn't be doing, whether it's, you know, put, I, I hate putting labels on that because everyone's different. <clears throat> put in what it is, your own vice. But if you've got something, if your flesh is dictating to you what you should do, it's hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Do you want to please God? Then don't live in the flesh. Don't give in to temptation. Don't submit. Now I know nobody wakes up going, you know what, I'm going to become a serial killer. It's also a, a paedophile or a, whatever you want to put in there. But it happens little by little step. Nobody says I want to be a drug addict. Nobody sets off like that. It's just step. Nobody sets off going, you know what, I'm going to have an affair today. Yeah, today I'll have an affair. No, it's a glance. It's a look. It's, I would have see somebody and they say, oh, you smell nice. An old lady with her husband, so it kind of fine. She goes, oh, you do smell nice. What is that? What's that aftershave you got? And I went, it's Lynx Africa. She goes, oh, it smells good. She'll says to husband, you need to get some of that. He goes, I am wearing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Awkward. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, we all bought anger out here. But, it's, but the things of God are our spirit submits to the things of God, but our flesh, if we operate in the flesh, it's, it's hostile to God. Philippians 3, verse 18 and 19 says this For as I have often told you before, and now tell you even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. We talk about Christians here who live as enemies, they're saved, but they're living as enemies because of their lifestyle. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. So if we are thinking is on earthly things, then not God. See, everything you should do, everything you do should have an eternal perspective. Eternal perspective. That's just the way to look at things. Romans 12 verse 2, a verse that many of you know, says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So our minds need to be transformed. How do our minds get transformed? Through reading the word of God and spending time with God. Why is it so hard to spend time with God? More people spend time with a budgie. I'm thinking because nobody will have a budgie. Oh, Joey. Then they do spend time with God. They spend more time with, with their hobbies and stuff than they do spend with God. See, whenever I'm hiking, I love hiking, I love climbing, I love getting outdoors. Why? Because I spend time with God. I'm walking, he's walking with me. Where I go, he goes. And we go together. Galatians 6 verse 7 and 8 says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. So if you invest in your spirit, then you'll have life. If you invest in your flesh, and I'm going to take us down the road if I'm not careful, it leads to destruction. Why is it so many people have complications about even t attending church once a week? Two hours out of 168 hours. Two hours. Can't be bothered. Or so much more important. I've got some close people, I won't mention because you'll know them, um, who's struggling in their family, struggling in their lives at the minute, they're having a hard time. And it's got teenage kids, and he said, How come your kids are in church and we can't get asked to go? And I says, 
Well, because you don't take, church is not a priority to you. He said, what do you mean? It's a church and a priority. You take it or leave it, can't board. Somewhere else, somewhere better. A match. I know he likes his football. See, when I became a Christian, I did go to Leeds matches, but never on a Sunday. I used to play rugby, but when I became a Christian, their matches were on Sunday, I left playing rugby. Because I wanted to spend time with God and God's people. I gave up things to spend time in church. You know, God does not fit his agenda around us. If we mean business with God, we fit ourselves around him. Yeah, but, Johnny, you don't understand my situation. No, I don't. I understand God's. And when you get to heaven, you can explain to God why you couldn't be bothered. Because if you've got mind sat on, set on things of the Spirit, things of God, you would move heaven and earth to be where you... Put it this way. I ask people stuff every now and then, and I can tell what's going on. Like, when I say to Jo, do you fancy going for five days walking in the dales? She went, yeah, but what about the dog? In other words, no, I do not want to go. But she didn't want to say that. But when she said, I'm thinking about going on holiday with one of my, uh, do you fancy going to Canary Islands? I said, absolutely not. But if you're a friend to go, you can go. She made it happen. The mind was fixed on it. She was going. Dale's completely, I don't even walk in Dale's, you know. She made up all the excuses. When your mind is set on something, it's like when somebody, you know, that moment, now for most of us, we can't remember it, that moment, you know, you spot somebody, oh, she's all right, or he's all right. Ding! You'll move anywhere, heaven and earth to get to know that person. Um, you know what I mean? When your mind's set on the things of God, you don't care about the things of the flesh. John uh, 4, 27, it says this. It says, God is spirit and those who, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The outward experience or the outward signs that hands up, sat down, standing or whatever, is okay, but it should be a reflection of the heart and it should only be reflecting what's going on in your spirit. And some people can have their hands raised up, but inside they're thinking, oh, I wish she should up, I hate it. You know, oh, what's she doing over there? And the mind's going somewhere else. Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. You need to keep his mind fixed on the things of God. Verse 8, sorry, verse 9 of Romans 8, it says this, You are, however, talking about the believers, are not in the realm of the flesh. So when you become a Christian, you're actually not in the realm of the flesh. You've been born again, you've been set free, you've been delivered. Your spirit has been sealed, you're alive. But you've still got a stinking body. And I'm not talking about having a mucky body. You've still got a fleshly body. And you should walk by the spirit and walk in the thing and tell the spirit. what. See, this is where I got to when I first got saved. Johnny, you kill your body. <coughs> People go to the gym all the time to do that, don't they? Pumping away. Because they don't mind a little bit of pain because there's something else. Guys, we should put up with the pain and suffering of life sometimes because we've got a greater reward ahead of us. We've got something awesome and amazing ahead of us. Um, if, so it says, however, you, did, you are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If indeed, the word if there can be said since, indeed, the spirit of God lives in you. And if, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, but, and then even though the body is subject to death outside because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, um, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because the spirit lives in you. In other words, put your body to death and let your spirit live and fly through you and your spirit will give life to your mortal body. Now we all got to eat. We've all got to eat. And there's nothing wrong with eating nice things. And I hate going about food. But I don't want to pick on anything else. But the truth is, our flesh can try to dictate. Set a test this week. Set a test. So for me, Joe's going to waste. So do you know what I said I'm going to do? I'm not going to do any games. Do you know why? Because if she's not there to talk to me, I would just game, game, game. So instead, I just thought, you know what? Instead of playing games, I'm going to read the Bible. 
I'm cruising through the New Testament. It's like, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. I've had to slow down and go, hang on, I need to think about this. Why? Because I'm not watching telly and I'm not playing games. And I ain't got a wife to distract me. And usually Ethan's playing all right upstairs. You know, doing his work or whatever. Doing his own work from school. Who knows? You know, but when he's, when he's in. So we're doing these things. Why? Because I set my mind. And partly because... I didn't want to go down any avenues with Joe not being there because she's my right hand person. She's the one person that can slap me. <laughs> sort yourself out, mate. She's the one that can say, get out of that hole. Anyway, where am I? Sorry. Colossians 3, verse 1 and to 3 says, Since then you have been now uh, yeah, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above or your minds on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden in Christ Jesus our God. Um, Corinthians 5, 14 to 18 says this. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, you will be destroyed by each other. So I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Point taken. When you're thinking about the things of God, you're not likely to do something stupid, are you? Sinful. Or maybe you are. Who knows? You know, if I'm round for tea, you're not going to have something on the telly, which is obviously something you can watch. <laughs> well, at least I'd say something. So I say, what about the spirit? And you will not gratify the desires of the spirit. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that they do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. I'm going to get into leading by the Spirit next week, because people think it's like being a robot, and it's not. Galatians carries on. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. You're going to have to look up these words. Idolatry, witchcraft. Witchcraft basically is trying to control people. It's not about casting spells, but it's about controlling people. So if you're a controlling person, you need to be careful. Hatred, discord, jealousies, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 22, 25 continues. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit. The nice bit. Well, we don't do that stuff, but we like this but. You see, it's not just about not doing things, it's about allowing things. If you walk by the Spirit, if you live by the Spirit, these things should naturally come out of you. So these things should naturally flow from you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh over here, crucified with its passions and its desires, since they live by the Spirit over here. Let's keep in step with the Spirit. Do you know nobody's ever going to complain at you for loving them too much? Stop. Stop that loving me. Stop being so joyous. Except if they're miserable. You know what I mean? If, you, if you've got kind of... Oh, stop being kind. Actually, we are living in a world that is bordering towards certain things where they're saying what is good is evil and what is evil is good. And it's swapping over, so we need to be aware. And that's what will make us distinct, walking by the Spirit, that we honour the things of God. You see, it's all about, this is what the last statement I'm going to make, it's all about how much we give ourselves to God. If you give yourself totally to God, you walk by the Spirit. If you give a part to God, then you can't call him Lord, because he's Lord of all, or not at all, as he used to say now the struggles, there are things that we need to work through, I understand that. But ultimately, if you give yourself totally to God, you will walk by the Spirit. Yes, you will mess up at odd times. Yes, there will be trials and tribulations, that's guaranteed. Yes, there will be trouble. But give yourself to God. Not anybody else, not even a spouse, not even a kid, not even a grandkids, not even anything like that. Give yourself to God. And then whether you give yourself more to God, you will learn to love people like you've never loved them before. You want to love your loved ones? Love God first. 
And then from that, you will love them beyond what they could ever dream or imagine. You want to do what's right in this world according to God? It means standing out. It means putting Jesus first. It means putting his priorities in your life before your priorities in your life. You see, I've been invited to parties. I've, I've been invited to different places. And I've gone, no, I'm not coming because there's something usually of God. I've told you this before, I got in, well, I'd only been a Christian a short time and I got invited to a party on the house group night. And I went to this party and I'm thinking, well, I wonder what the house group's doing. They're starting in about 10 minutes. And I thought, forget this, I'm out of here. Went straight to the house group and everybody laughed at me. Everyone was thinking, what are you doing? You need it. There'll always be another house group. No. That broke summer and the house group, church, all that stuff has never been a problem for me. We go on holiday and I always find a church. Sometimes I don't understand what they're saying. But I find one. Why? Because I want to be around people that love Jesus. When I'm around people, I love finding Christians. I love talking to non-Christians. But I love, I love being around people who, who love Jesus. Why? Because the spirit in me and the spirit within them is celebrating. It says when two or three get together, there I am. So when I'm with you, there he is. I know he's with us always. But you know what I mean? He's there in a special way. So for you guys, you've got to make a priority in your life of putting God first, for walking according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. And yeah, sleep is important. It is important. A job is important. Family is important. But when you stand before Jesus at the end of life, when you stand before him, when he's raptured us all up there, when you stand there, are you going to say, well, God, you know, I did spend so many hours at work. I did all right. I saved up and bought that brand new car. Do you like it? Well, it's not here with you. Jesus says that we shouldn't have anything in our lives before him. That includes all the things that we do put before him. So live for God. And now I'm going to shut up. Because he won't come back next week. But carry on. So just live for Jesus, make him your number one priority. And yet if you're struggling, you might struggle for the rest of your life, but put Jesus first. You might have a whole life ahead of you, put Jesus first. You might have messed up completely. Great, okay, put that behind you, put Jesus first. Seek God. First seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you. Don't worry about anything. Put Jesus first. Because that's what it's about. So, it's all about how much of yourself you give to God. And are you giving a little bit? Are you giving everything? Because when I got saved, the pastor said to me, you either give it all now <coughs> or don't bother. That was a good threat, wasn't it? Yeah. Ooh, right, I'm all in. And I've never been back out. Yet other people say, I get saved and gradually come in. Guys, you're either in one kingdom or another. So decide. Be in the world and live like the world and have an awesome time and go burning hell. Or live for Jesus, have an awesome time but suffer persecution and trials and tribulations and then live forever with Jesus celebrating him. Like that video of praise. I mean, imagine that's what it's going to be like in heaven. We're all rocking away. So I hope that's been encouraging for you. I hope that's been a blessing for you. Let me pray for you and then we can go through and get some teas and coffees. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are amazing, that you are awesome. Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for the worship we've been able to just put before you. And I pray right now that the words that have been said, Lord, if from you will settle in our hearts. Lord, that they will grow to be good, to produce good fruit in our lives. Lord, help us to keep focused on you and you alone. Lord, not to get distracted, not to get torn away. Lord, not to be run off the road, but to keep our focus on you at all times. Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing in everybody's life, both here and both listening. I pray, Lord, that you will fulfill your promises in their lives, Lord. I pray that you'll keep them safe as they walk closer to you. Amen.